Chapter 25 Zelda couldn't have imagined how surreal it would be to watch Cece enter the royal chamber. There were so few people from her old life that she'd seen in the time since being taken, and none that had been so close to her home and orbit. The fashion mogul didn't look quite as she remained in memory. Of course. A new monarchy had given the famous designer a perfect opportunity to rewrite fashion once more, and these days she wouldn't be caught dead in past seasons, gauche mushroom patterns and frilled dresses, what with their indiscriminate tailoring and nebulous shapes. This CC was cinched into severe duchess satin lines, corseted snugly with a rooted bustle that danced behind her steps like a peacock's plumage. Her rosy pink hair was twisted high up in a chignon, pinned in place with a jaunty stuffed bird. A yellow ribbon of measuring tape hung around her neck, as well as a pair of silver scissors suspended on a long matching chain. Cece must have been just as overwhelmed with the queen's transformation, as she lifted matching velvet-gloved fingers to her lips, beholding the farm girl in her lily and crane-printed dressing gown, her golden hair no longer yanked back with a hairband but intricately twisted up in a crowning braid, the excess curled and pinned at the nape of her neck. Though it was still early, Zelda had already set the coal to her eyes and rouge in her cheeks, an imperative that no longer required the assistance of any of the castle's resident Gerudo. She'd mastered the look so well, she could sweep the lines in her sleep. Your Highness, you've become absolutely magnificent. C.C. breathed in awe, dropping into a silly curtsy before Zelda's feet. Oh, C.C., that's really not necessary, she said in a tide of embarrassment. Had she been so displeasing to the seamstress' discerning eye? The Hylian family dynasty may have been vengefully dismantled, but at least the princess didn't look ordinary any longer. Praise Din. I'm sorry, your highness, my shock must seem abhorrent. She shook her head, drawing herself back together. There should be no surprise that you'd shine, now that you're finally free and back where you were planted. Really? All those years, beneath all of our noses, and we couldn't be bothered to see what distress you were in. No one asking themselves why a goddess would condemn herself to a life in a hovel. What a ghastly indictment of our town indeed. A tinny laugh squeaked from Zelda's throat, sure that Cece had to be joking. She understood the necessity of appearances, a narrative to smooth and sand down the audacity of Ganondorf's seizure of power, and her own acquiescence. But the people of Hyrule, they hadn't actually believed it. Had they? How could they, after knowing both of them as friends and neighbors, of seeing their sacrifices through their own eyes restoring the kingdom twice over? There was no mirth, however, in Cece's somber apology, and so Zelda simply nodded, and waved her hand, flexing her regal right to brush away what she no longer wished to hear. Please show me what you've brought. It's been all I could think about this entire week. Absolutely, Cece said stepping out of the doorway with a showman's scrolling fanfare, clearing the way for her four assistants to enter, each carrying a work of art on a headless mannequin. As they set up and properly straightened every drape and pleat, Cece took full advantage of the quiet to take in every delectable detail of the queen's intimate space. With her signature lack of subtlety, she pivoted her body in a snail's pace ballerina twirl, careful not to miss a note, no matter how mundane, the bookshelves, the old-fashioned vanity and matching armoire, the four-posted bed, changed over to lighter, gozier curtains and linens for the warmer weather. Her scope came to rest at the fireplace, the most striking change Zelda had made to the space. Gone was the somber, colorless stone hearth that had gated the room's fire for centuries. In its place, a marble-carved mantle of her own design, chiseled from her sketches by the craftsmen in Terrytown. At each corner were two stallions, one Gerudo and one Hylian, their manes woven with all the lush flora of the valley, amaranth sandelions, swift violets, safina, and silent princess blossoms. Just like the king upon its unveiling, Cece did not comment on the sculpture, but rather the wall above. Is that? She dared. The master's sword, yes. Mounted right above the mantel shelf the metallic blade catching every facet of light and reflecting it in an undeniably supernatural glow. Isn't it dangerous? Cece asked, leaning in closer to inspect the navy hilt and Triforce engraving. It can only be wielded by the hero of Hyrule. 
Zelda recited the oracle for what felt like the hundredth time, her patience flattening. As our hero is dead, it's useless. It might be a hundred years before another emerges. For now, the king prefers to keep it somewhere generally inaccessible. That and severing Link's head for a mount may have been a rift Ganondorf was unwilling to patch. The fruitless promise of the precious artifact winking at her each night in the dark was torment enough for her, and triumph enough for him. Cece may not have been abstruse herself, but she was more than adept at reading through the lines. And what a privilege it is to be invited into this sanctuary, to serve you on this most auspicious occasion. She trilled, gesturing to the menagerie of fabrics and trim now properly arranged. Whatever you select today I'll have tailored and refitted within the week, which will give plenty of time for the ball. Everything had come together so quickly, and scarcely glimpsed by her. Invisible hands deft in scrolling calligraphy wrote hundreds of invitations brought to the lucky recipient's doorsteps by royal escort. A twelve-piece orchestra, more musician than Zelda had ever seen assembled at once, rehearsed below the dais in the sanctum. The day before, a tiered tray with six small frosted sponges appeared with her tea, and when she asked the servant girl about them, she was informed they were samples for the commemorative cake, as if the queen should have been expecting it. Carrot cake is always going to be my favorite, Zelda voted. I, um, I believe His Supreme Highness has already asked for red velvet, the girl admitted. Then why have I been asked? I'm sorry, Your Highness, but I think they were hoping that you'd agree. First, this is seafoam gossamer, with gold leaf detail. Cece introduced, fluffing the endless skirt that flared like a soft, sinking tulip around the carved mannequin waist. Three circlets of molded gold fauna circled the torso, matched by three identical rings capping the billowing sleeves. Cece, this is the most beautiful dress I've ever seen. Zelda breathed. Flushed with the surprise that she could care so instantly and deeply over something so slight, hesitating to touch the ethereal confection, lest it burst into stardust and fall back into the sea, evoked so perfectly in its waves and waves of soft layers. Oh, your highness, you can't be so easily impressed with the first piece you see, she said with a winning grin. Although I did have Sage dye it, it specifically to match your eyes. Sag, she laughed. Almost giddy as the assistant overseeing the easy first choice freed the frock from the stand, bunching the skirt up for Zelda's head and arms to slide through. How is he doing? Drunk and insane, as always. Cece clipped, transforming the queen with a swift tug of the skirt, moving behind her to lace up the back. But such an eye for color. Now I just send my girls to deal with him. The designer's hands rose to unclasp the necklace around her neck, but the moment her fingers met the clasp she shot back, yelping as if nipped by a small pet. What in Nary's name? Necklace stays on, Zelda said flatly. It's just so severe for such an effervescent look, she said, wringing her fingers. Then you'll have to take it up with the king. No, of course not, Cece shook her head wildly. Contrast can add much. Unexpected depth to an ensemble. I'll add some ruby and sapphire to the gold leafing. That will help tie it all together. A marked improvement, even, from before. She reassured herself. Zelda stepped over to the vanity, stretching her arms out in a symphony conductor's pose, watching the waves of impossibly light, airy fabric echo each move. Giggling with delight, she scrunched the cloud of her skirt twirling in the mirror to see it cinch and unfurl around her. Unlike the rigid court dresses that defined her early days in the castle, or the rough, ancient tunic afforded by Roru's court, or even the comfortable and elegant but mandated robes that filled the chamber armoire, this dress felt like her. Not who she was intended to be, but what she had actually become. You've outdone yourself, truly, Zelda admitted. Just try not to smile quite that wide at the ball, C.C. teased, or I'll never crawl out from all the demand that comes my way. As Zelda watched C.C. fuss with a set of hair clips in the mirror, she watched the door crack open in the reflection, and His Supreme Highness crossed over the threshold.
Noting the same intrusion, Cece and her assistants plunged to the ground as if dodging fireballs. Please, stand. I don't wish to impede progress, he said, crossing his arms and taking in the assembled shop with an unreadable stare. He drank in the three options, then came to rest on Zelda. Her lips twitched with a strangled impression of her vanished joy, a tepid attempt to draw out his favor, which seemed strangely unreachable here, lost in a vision she could not shape or shade. Do you like it? she asked, feeling just as foolish as she sounded. He considered a moment, his fingers tapping against his elbows. You'll be the envy of every hopeless spinster in Hyrule in that, he finally said, drawing a frenzied, high-pitched laugh from Cece's gut that hammered Zelda's eardrums. Well, your Supreme Highness, that's why we came prepared with an array of options to choose from, she noted, gesturing to the three ignored gowns hanging in wait. It's been over a century. Since the crown has hosted an event such as this, and it's difficult to know, precisely, what the tone should be. But you're absolutely right. Her Highness has become so sophisticated, such a cosmopolitan icon. At your side, this look is much too provincial. What a strange, stupid thing to be upset about, Zelda knew. Of all the moments, of all the days spent in a life, she only pressed her nose against the glass to see. But at that instant, it was all she could do to keep from seizing the hairpin trapping Cece's dead bird and tearing it through Cece's tittering, traitor's jugular. What is delivered? What is dormant? Hylia's riddle swelled in her mind like the tide, blotting out the meaningless descriptions of the red, gold embroidered fishtail gown with the flowing train that looked like an exquisite folded dinner napkin. A ridiculous brocade the size of a circus tent thick with laces, appliques and bows, enough to sink her to the bottom of Lake Hylia. The final wooden carved torso was the most grandiose, lurking in the corner of the room, a diva unwilling to grace the stage until her limelight was set. An impeccable trace of thread on curve, with layers of midnight blue and pitch black chiffon tumbling down from the bare shoulders, flaring out in plumes of swelling ostrich feathers. The high waist, hitting just below the plunging neck, was bound by a constellation of diamonds that spilled down the slinking skirt like falling stars. That one, Ganondorf said, gesturing to the glinting shadow woman in the corner. You know I'd save the best for last. Cece clucked, frantically ushering the assistant forward. I had to hire private security while I worked on this. Set with over 300 carats of Death Mountain diamonds, not to mention the noir ostrich feathers that have to be harvested from the forest ostriches up in the Great Sky Island. And... She cleared her throat, signaling for the gown's attendant to retrieve a velvet box from behind the display, which she opened to reveal a tiara boasting sapphires the size of grapes, framed by diamond teardrops hugging the jewels and half-moon scallops. You couldn't get away with wearing this masterpiece without a crown. I'm sure you can work that into law, right, your majesty? She giggled, deeply satisfied with herself. This is exactly what we need, he said. Something that no one else can have. Without another word, Cece was behind her once more, yanking the laces away from the dress she'd chosen. Zelda's hands instinctively flew to her chest, defensively holding up the bodice as it was swiftly torn away, the clinging darkness drowning her before she had a moment to breathe. I'm going to have to implore you not to fuss too much, darling, Cece demanded, carefully pulling the precise points of the garment to clench her body. I'll have no more expeditions up to the sky if any of these pieces get plucked. She didn't turn to look in the mirror after the crown was wedged into her braided hair, ignored the practiced gasps of Cece's staff and the designer herself, the rounds of congratulations that echoed each other over such a trove of riches, and oh how clever they were to possess them, and what a sensation of jealousy this proclamation of pure glamour would cause, and how very overdue, after such a heinous stretch of time, that Hyrule deserved this, didn't it? Needed it. This reminder of how wondrous it had been once, and was finally becoming once more. She let her limbs sag loose as the yellow tape ran its laps around her, ticking off measurements like counting currency, tasks requiring nothing but the yielding of her flesh. 
a prerequisite she was becoming incredibly adept at. She observed with the detachment of a woman sitting on the riverbank, watching Carrion slide and vanish into the Russian current. DC's caravan scuttled on the outskirts of the castle, avoiding any possible glimpse from the townspeople below. Even though her creations were wrapped up in white sheets and bundled snugly around mannequins lugged by her miniature cavalcade of assistants to the waiting wagon and its horseback escort of what Link assumed were the low-rent, Hateno village version of mercenaries, bored husbands armed to the teeth with kitchen knives and pitchforks, their faces obscured by hedonistic grimaces, they burned into metal buckets. C.C. herself kept her gloved hands cupped around her face, as if anticipating a torrent of pure pad camera clicks to rise from the courtyard, empty but for the ornamental arrangement of guards nodding off around the perimeter. Marina had been down earlier, moaning the closed-door policy of the chamber and the sad lack of gossip that ensued. C.C.'s insistence on armed guards had drummed up a moderate buzz over how many jewels and gems she could have crammed into the fabrics, and a lively discussion over how fine one piece of clothing could be. But there was so little to go on, and the staff eventually grew bored. Moving on to discuss the parallel celebrations happening in Newcastle Town, below. The dozens of parties and get-togethers in tandem with the royal event itself, extending opportunities to dress up and buy mountains of cakes and wines, and imported cheeses to those who could never hope to land an elite invitation within Hyrule Castle's gate. We'll be stationed in the sanctum, Marina bragged as she carefully unwrapped a honey crepe from a strip of parchment, licking her fingertips. I'll be sure to gather up all the tasty bits of news, since there's no way you losers are being let inside. Come on, Clee argued. They've got to have an extra layer of protection in there. What with every person worth missing in Hyrule crammed inside. No idiot. That's why they'll need you. Outside. Marina rolled her eyes. I swear to God, you all have the tactical minds of squirrels. Can you please describe to me what the Yiga recruitment process is like? Do you just open a door, or what? The glass library door behind Cleet opened, and the leftovers spilled to the ground as Marina snapped herself to attention in the eyes of what looked to be a very high-ranking Verena. Perhaps the highest, with her towering gilded spear and jeweled ponytail clip that was aspiring to be a full tiara. Herman that. Gimbo. She barked, sweeping her gaze across the long patio, until Link and his comrade hesitantly nudged forward. Follow me. The two Yiga soldiers shadowed after their assumed superior into the library, and the remaining watch could scarcely contain their tittering shock behind them. Their three sets of footsteps reverberated through the cavernous, empty space, past the leather chairs Link watched Zelda nestle into through the cold months, when he'd imagined sneaking behind her shoulder, see how many pages he could read along before she caught him, maybe beat his old record of 27 from the loft, he noticed that the tabletop map of Hyrule had been moved to the side of the room, cleared of its pegs. They walked the entire length of the room until the Verena came to a halt at an unassuming bookcase he instantly recognized. She wrapped her spear against the shelving three times, then slid it away like a screen to reveal the king's study. Little had changed since that afternoon years ago, after their disastrous archaeology trip to Farron. They sullen. Sad space not unlike a prison cell. The only semblance of windows were framed portraits set in scrolling, golden frames that were utterly wasted, with no light to catch save for a few meager candles. Above the desk was a painting of the queen rendered even more severely than the drastic fashion in which she haunted this fortress. Wrapped in a gauzy black kimono adorned with the Gerudo crest, the same version that Ganondorf now wore hunched over a stack of papers, placed upon the worn wood where he'd held down Zelda's hips, the memory so vivid he could still smell the thunderstorm and leather saddle hitting his nostrils as he sank between her legs. Your Supreme Highness, the Yiga who brought in the menace, she introduced. The king grunted his acknowledgement, finishing whatever review he was conducting before pushing back on the chair, rising up and nearly scraping the ceiling. Gentlemen, he nodded, an air of disinterest hanging between them as he crossed his arms, his gaze shifting between the two identical masks. 
I trust you've been enjoying your reprieve from the swamp. Link felt his heart clanging in his ears. Herman seemed just as anxious to speak as he did. He nodded vigorously, hoping it would be enough. By the goddess's grace, he moved on without missing a step. I want you to understand how much I personally appreciate your service, which deserves its own commendation, especially in the audience that will be assembling next week. Snuffing out the menace of Hyrule was the most pivotal achievement in the first year of my reign, and it would be impossible to move forward to more blissful, fruitful endeavors if you were still lurking out there, plotting some misguided return. If it were up to me, we'd make an exceptional point of honoring your work during our upcoming event. Unfortunately, I know you're aware of the Queen's feelings on your faction. He gestured to the woman and her empty stare in the frame, her blue eyes cutting through the dimness only to land vacantly in the space above their heads. He turned away from them to regard her flattened specter, considering, Her Highness is pragmatic, but there's a sensitivity with this particular issue. To stir this dust is to invite complications I prefer to avoid. I assume you can understand. Another pause, the soldiers daring each other to shatter the hint of a question, feeling the relief sink into their bones when he resumed the cherished sound of his own voice. Still. I'd like to extend the honor to both of you of being reassigned, for the evening, to patrol duty within the sanctum. I'd like you to at least be present in a toast to your successes, even if they remain unnamed. And the cake will be delicious. You're dismissed, the Verena determined, tipping her spear toward the door. Bowing in grateful unison for the dismissal, they turned to the door. Link had taken a single step when what felt like the weight of a lionel paw sank his shoulder, squeezing him tight, strong enough to tear him off the stone floor. A blonde yiga. How unusual. Ganondorf sneered, one calloused finger twisting a flaxen lock springing like a fern from his top knot. Every muscle in Link's body drew taut as he took stock of the room. Marina's sharpened spear, Link's meager eightfold blade. The gloom tinged Katana close enough now to knock against his thigh. The space was tight and enclosed, nowhere for Ganondorf's large body to hide. He could land a hard strike, fatal if he was lucky and fast enough, at the very least enough to slow him down. The library echoed up through the entire east wing, Zelda's territory, a loud enough shout, and she could hear, perhaps, if the skies aligned for one bleated goodbye. The king tossed his head back, flashing his molars as he cackled. They must give you so much shit, he said, shoving him out of the study with a jovial, overpowered pat on the shoulder. Air had never felt as fresh as it did on Zelda's precious courtyard, free of the library and Ganondorf's brief attention, pummeled instead with the slings and arrows of his burning jealous cohorts. End of chapter 4